And thank you all for joining us once again um, on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. It is my pleasure to introduce the second lecture by Dr. Bronco Van Alpen. Um, we are really fortunate that he's able to join us from his home in the Netherlands to present another fascinating topic, one that I am particularly um, excited about. Today, he's speaking on the noble collection of attic vases, which as you know, if you've been following our Celebrating 100 Years exhibition series that we kicked off with the making of a museum last fall, the noble collection truly um, kind of anchors the Tampa Museum of Arts collection. The acquisition um, kind of set the stage, set the standard for what acquisitions would, would come and what the collection would come to be at the Tampa Museum of Art. Before I turn it over to my colleague Bronco, again, I am um, informally um, mentioning him by the name of Bronco because I do feel like he is a good friend and colleague. I just wanna thank our Antiquity Circles members for your continued support of this lecture series and for just continuing to show your enthusiasm for it, our Antiquities collection. We hope that we continue to bring you um, superb programming as we head into 2021. So with that, um, actually, let me give you a little bit of a brief background on Bronco. This is their first time joining us. Dr. Bronco Van Alpen received his PhD from the City University of New York, where he studied with Sarah Pomeroy. For the past, um, for over five years, he worked at the Pearson Museum in the Netherlands, which holds the archeological collection of the University of Amsterdam. His interests include clay seal impressions, Romano Egyptian, Romano-Egyptian mummy portraits, as well as animals in ancient material culture. Um, so with that, let me turn it over to my colleague Bronco and have him give us the um, introduction to the noble collection of attic vases. Welcome Bronco, good to see you. Hi Joanna, thanks for that lovely introduction and uh, uh, happy to be, uh, to be here again today. Fantastic, I'm all queued up so I'm ready to go. All right, well, uh, first of all, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us this webinar uh, via Zoom or live via Facebook. Uh, in today's Antiquities Lecture, I would like to pitch a proposal for an exhibition centered around the noble collection of attic vases, as uh, Joanna has just uh, mentioned. Um, but before I start, though, I would very much like to thank the team at the TMA for their support and assistance providing background information and images while I'm working from home across the Atlantic, some uh, six time zones away. Um, and I would also like to extend my, um, <clears throat> excuse me, my warmest gratitude to Bill Zawatsky for his enthusiasm and for all the information, images and suggestions he has generously shared with me. For some 35 years, the Joseph Veitch Noble Collection forms the cornerstone of the permanent antiquities collection of the Tampa Museum of Art, as Joanna has just uh, reminded you. Uh, it may therefore also be time to consider how to recontextualize and reinterpret this prominent collection. So my talk today will propose an international exhibition and research project with that aim in mind uh, and to focus especially on the attic vases from the TMA's noble collection. Uh, the presentation will therefore have three main sections, beginning with uh, Joseph Beach Noble himself first, followed by a review of a selection of nobles attic vases and then finally, the actual pitch for an international exhibition concept. As Brittany mentioned, if during this talk at any time you uh, have a question, feel free to use the raise hand function. Uh, you may write your question also in the comments, in the chat function uh, via Facebook. Uh, and if you wish, or if you prefer to speak, uh, the raise hand function will unmute your volume uh, so it's whichever you prefer. Uh, there may be, or there's very likely to be room for questions after the presentation as well. Uh, we are always interested in what you think, and this webinar is explicitly designed to invite your input. Uh, there will in fact also be a survey we'd welcome if you'd fill out. Um, but let us begin. 
Joseph Veitch Noble, whom you see here uh, uh, on this slide, was born in Philadelphia in 1920. Although he was a pre-med at UPenn, he began a career while still in college as a documentary cinematographer. After the Second World War, he quickly worked his way up to become executive vice president and a film studio, uh, at a film studio in the early 1950s. By 1956, he was appointed operating administrator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, a position he held until 1967, when he became the Met's vice director of administration. As he himself explained at the time, the museum's Sorry, there's a, uh, a chat that there is no video comment. Sorry. Um, uh, as he uh, ex himself explained at the time, the museum's director, Tom Hoving's job is to pull the museum up to the sky, while Noble himself thought that his job was to hold the museum's feet to the ground, uh, implying, uh, in other words, that the mat was stretched between heaven and earth as well as between the director and himself. In 1970, Noble left the Metropolitan to become director of the Museum of the City of New York, where he served until 1985. Um, I noticed that there is a, a bit of a problem. I hope that it can be solved soon. Um, sorry about that. Um, Noble was also instrumental in exposing three Etruscan terracotta warriors of colossal size, the largest being six and a half feet, uh, as modern forgeries. The Met had acquired these sculptures at the time of the First World War at the advice of Gisela Richter. At the time, she was a, an assistant curator at the museum, but she would later become the museum's first female curator. The most complete statue that you see here was purchased for a whopping $40,000 in 1918, uh, which if authentic would today easily sell for at least half a million dollars. Noble's arguments were not only based on stylistic or artistic grounds, but also on technical and scientific grounds. And in 1961, one of the forgers involved in this fraud confessed and explained how these works had been created. The statues had been sculpted in clay and then deliberately broken before being fired. Uh, the fragments were actually fired afterwards, then buried, supposedly rediscovered in the company of witnesses, and then reassembled to quote unquote, restore them uh, and sell them. The forger had even kept a missing thumb uh, and uh, by doing so had substantiated his confession. After years of technical examination, Noble also claimed in 1967 that the bronze statue of Horus that you see here was a modern forgery. At the time, the sculpture was actually admired as an early classical masterpiece of the fifth century before the common era and the single most important object in the Met's classical collection. Noble's arguments were based on careful analyses and the best available expertise of the time. The controversial assertion nevertheless caused an international uproar that even reached Dutch newspapers. Five years later, however, scientific uh, or extensive scientific analysis, including thermoluminescence dating of the clay core of the sculpture um, uh, by a panel of experts, reinstated this statue as genuine, as an ancient work of art, except that it was now redated to the late Hellenistic period, that is the second or first century before the common era. But let's be sure, the vindication of the object's authenticity says nothing about Noble's efforts to spot a forgery, for fakes pose a persistent problem in the trade of antiquities and bronzes are particularly susceptible to falsification. Obviously, the reason that we're talking about Joseph Beach Noble today is because he acquired a superb collection of antiquities of international renown, certainly among specialist circles. His collection of vases is particularly noted for its breadth of themes and styles, forms and techniques. 
Nobu acquired his first ancient object in 1935 at the age of 14 years old, namely a pair of possibly Roman Egyptian earrings of scarab beetles in amber that are now in the TMA collection. He began collecting antiquities more seriously from 1952, uh, and in the 50s he purchased about 74 Greek vases, including fragments, uh, and in the 1960s another 38 more. After that, uh, only minor artifacts were added to his collection. Noble developed a remarkably focused, uh, sorry, Noble developed a remarkably focused vision for his comprehensive collection. The paradoxical observation means to say that Noble, uh, that the Noble collection is well defined in its scope and purpose, but within that focused field aimed at completeness. As he himself uh, put it, the whole of the collection should be greater than the sum of its parts. In his pursuit, Noble consulted Dietrich von Bothwer, uh, a curator for six decades at the Met and a leading specialist in Greek vases, as well as the element, uh, eminent scholar of Attic vases, John Beasley, who was professor um, of classical archaeology and art at Oxford uh, from 1925 through 1956. Noble's primary uh, focus was on shape, that is, collecting a full range of possible shapes of epic vases. Visitors of the Tampa Museum of Art will recognize this chart uh, from the Lemonopolis Gallery. With Greek vases, form follows function. Think of an amphora, a two-handled container of liquids and solids, or the hydria, a water jar, a crater, wine mixing vessel, or an oinokoe, a wine jug, a cantharos, a drinking cup with two high vertical handles, which is actually not on this chart, a kilix, which is a shallow two-handled drinking cup, usually on a stamped foot, the right on, a drinking horn or a fiale, a pouring or a libation dish, an aribalos, a round vessel, a lekythos, which is a narrow oil vessel, an alabastron, a perfume flask, and so on. In addition to collector of antiquities, museum administrator, and then director, Joseph Noble was also a self-trained ceramic archaeologist. In this endeavor, he was a pioneer in technical analysis and laid the groundwork for our understanding of the production of ancient Greek vases. Noble published the results of his experimental research first in a preliminary article in 1960, uh, and then in the monograph of 1965. Earlier scholars had examined the red and black glazes typical of Attic pottery. Noble redefined the understanding of the process of oxidizing, reduction and re-oxidizing in the kiln. Noble was interested in the types of clay available to the Athenian potters, that is, their mineral composition, uh, as revealed through spectrographic analysis. He thus discovered, for instance, that Attic clay uh, substantially differs from South Italian Apulian clay, and that ancient Attic clay is similar but not identical to its modern counterpart. Such discoveries can thus assist us in establishing the origin of a vase production, uh, when it is, for instance, found in a different region than where it was produced or when the origin is entirely unknown. As the friends of the museum know, the TMA was fortunate to acquire the Noble Collection in 1986. Few of you will remember or be aware that James Genuine, the, TMA, the Tampa architect and son of Paul Genuine, was instrumental in this acquisition. In 1983, the TMA held three Noble vases on loan for the exhibition uh, Styles and Lifestyles of the Ancient Work. At the instigation of William Zawatsky, himself an avid vase collector and staunch supporter of the museum, Genuine met with Noble in 1984 to discuss the possibility that the TMA acquire the latter's collection. A nice little detail, moreover, is that the museum director at the time, Andrew Maas, 
got his first job with Mr. Noble at the Museum of the City of New York. Naturally, the affair involved many negotiations, not in the least to raise sufficient funds for the $1 million price tag. But with contributions from the city of Tampa, the county of Hillsborough, the state of Florida, and of course, many private donations, the TMA was able to purchase the collection. Joseph Noble incidentally also established an annual lecture in Greek, Roman and Etruscan ceramics in his name with an endowment at the Archaeological Institute of America. At the age of 87, Noble died in 2007 in West Orange, New Jersey. Uh, but before I move on, this might be a good time to ask if there are any questions among the audience. Please, please feel free to ask them or to raise your hand at any point uh, if there's something that I could clarify. Bronco, we do have one question from Facebook that asks, why is it called attic clay? Yes, that's actually a very good question and I apologize for not explaining that. Attica is a region in which Athens is the capital. And so in antiquity, Athens was an independent city-state um, where uh, the urban center was in Athens and Attica was the countryside with the villages around that city. So I hope that uh, addresses the question. Uh, and vases uh, from that collection uh, are, or from that area are called Attic vases. And I see another question popping up. Uh, no, indeed, uh, we will come back to this in a little while. Uh, Noble certainly did not just uh, collect attic vases, that was definitely his main interest, but he acquired vases from other regions and also objects from beyond uh, just vases. I will give you a few examples in a little while. So to reiterate, since its acquisition in 1986, the Joseph Veach Noble Collection forms the cornerstone of the permanent antiquities collection of the Tampa Museum of Art. The noble vases are of superior educational value to illuminate aspects of ancient myth and religion, warfare and athletics, wine culture and cosmetics, daily life and entertainment. The same black and red figure vases are also the basis of noble's own pioneering study of firing processes and other technical details. The oldest of Noble's attic faces, if I'm correct, is this late geometric triple skifos dated to the late 8th century. We're talking about approximately 725 to 700 before the Common Era. It is decorated with waterfowl and stars around a pattern that resembles an architectural element of circles between two triple lines separated into three tiers by lines and dots. The Skifos was a very popular skull-shaped cup that was used at least from the 9th century uh, before the common era onwards into Roman times. It could be made of any material from wood to ceramic, from gilded silver to cameo glass, and depending on its expenses, could be used for everyday class of people, for drinking anything from water or milk uh, to wine. The shape of this optical trick face imitates the stacking of these cups as they were at home in the cupboard. But such a vase would of course be rather impractical uh, and it is more likely that this kind of triple uh, uh, Skifos trick vase was made as a grave gift to be placed in the tomb. Acquired in 1964, this splendid pseudo panathenaic amphora was Noble's prize collection in more ways than one. At, 35, uh, at 13 and a half inch, this vase is only half the height of a true panathenaic amphora given as a prize in the ancient panathenaic games. This is therefore sort of imitating uh, a trophy that you could acquire at these uh, games. A trophy when one would be filled with 12 gallons of olive oil from the sacred grove of Athena at Academia. On the front, the noble vase, of course, portrays the patron goddess of Athens, Athena Promachos. That means 
the fighting in front, literally, or in other words, the champion in battle. The goddess is fully dressed and armed with a crested attic helmet and a round shield emblazoned with a tripod, which itself is a prize in some contests. She brandishes a spear and wears the Aegis, uh, the protective uh, sacred fleece. On the reverse of this vase that you cannot see here, uh, there's a scene of two jockeys competing in a horse race, which was one of the major events of the Panathenaic Games. This elegant cup is called Achilles, uh, a common shape of pottery with a white bowl, usually on a high stamped foot, such as here, and two horizontal handles. It was used for drinking wine. Notice how the stem, the lower body of the bowl, and the cup's interior are painted black, while the, reversed band, the reserved excuse me, band on the lip is left red for the delicate masterworks in miniature. On the red background here, on both sides, are the black figures of a siren and a sphinx facing each other, with added details in purple and in white. Between palmettes, that are difficult to see in this image, below the horizontal dividing line, um, there's an inscription in Greek that reads something like rejoice and drink up, or in other words, cheers and bottoms up. The work is attributed to the Tleson painter, that's an artist of whom we don't know the real name, but who decorated these kinds of master cups made by a potter whose name we do know, namely Tleson. Uh, the vase specialist that I mentioned earlier, John Beasley, suggested that the, the painter and the potter were in fact one and the same individual, uh, but there has so far not been any evidence to support this hypothesis. This often published Nekhidria, or water jar, offers a fascinating scene. Within the outline of an architectural structure sits a woman, dressed in a draped cloak with a scarf around her head. She holds a mirror in her hand and on the wall there is an alabastron or an, a flask for perfumed oil. Before her stands a, a, a younger boy and outside two men are approaching the building. Uh, one on the viewer's far right is a young man and there's a strigil and a sponge suspended in front of him that seems to imply that he has just visited the gymnasium. The other figure is an older bearded man leaning on his staff and holding a purse. The scene is often interpreted as the entrance to a brothel or as men procuring the services of a hetaira. That's a Greek term meaning a high class female companion. But this architectural scene might also be interpreted as a domestic setting uh, and then could be understood as a husband returning home with his hard-earned pay. The vase is attributed to the so-called Harrow painter, whose work often depicts scenes of pederastic, homoerotic, as well as heterosexual nature. The fighting warriors that you see on the shoulder of this vase seem to further emphasize a masculine theme rather than a domestic theme. Uh, the vase was created in Athens, but it was un unearthed in a tomb in Vulci, that is in Etruscan city in central Italy, about 50 miles northwest of Rome. Um, a hydria is a three-handled jar for containing water, that is what the name indicates, but it was also used for ashes of the deceased. And since it was found in a tomb, it is likely that this vase was offered as a grave gift or used as an urn. Visitors of the Tampa Museum of Art will know this beautiful calyx crater very well. Craters are vases used for mixing wine with water, for ancient wine was much stronger uh, and thick like a syrup before being mixed with water. This type is called calyx crater for its shape that resembles a flower bud. The scene depicts three women walking in procession dressed in classical garments. They are called the keton and the himation, an over and an undergarment. The central figure playing the lyre particularly draws our attention. 
The woman in front of her looks back and carries a torch. The companion in the back has an ivy wreath in her hair, holds a wine cup in one hand and a thyrsos, that is a pine cone tipped staff in the other. In other words, these women are maenads, followers of Dionysus, the god of wine. And since this vase is used for wine drinking, that of course is very appropriate. On the front side, or the obverse of this pelike, a type of amphora with a very heavy belly, we see a youth wearing a broad-brimmed hat that is called a petassos, and a clamis, a military cloak, riding on a galloping horse and holding a lance. This charming scene, interestingly, is very similar to a marble relief that you see here uh, in the center, uh, that is from the West Frieze of the Parthenon, now in the Acropolis Museum in Athens. And that relief is made in the Atelier of Phaedias, one of the most famous sculptures and sculpture, sculptors, pardon me, uh, and architects of the mid fifth century BCE. The reverse of the vase that uh, I'm not showing, unfortunately, uh, displays a heavily draped woman carrying a torch, which may refer to the Panuchis, that is an all-night ceremony that was part of the Panathenaic Games. The themes on the front and the back are therefore proudly chauvinistic. Uh, I'd like to add a personal note, namely that Beasley attributed this vase, this pelleki, to the so-called Westrenen painter, uh, which refers to another vase of the exactly same size, which is almost a counterpart of this one in the collection of Museum Mirmano in The Hague, the city in which I grew up in, in, the, in Holland. So to return to the question we had earlier, yes, indeed, uh, Noble's collection uh, that was acquired by the TMA does not comprise only of Attic vases, nor even of Greek vases. Uh, but also large and small skill sculpture in bronze and marble, jewelry and grave gemstones called intaglios, coins and even clay coin impressions for molding ancient fakes. Uh, and here are some uh, examples of uh, the sculpture in the collection from the noble uh, collection. As a specialist in Hellenistic queenship, I am particularly thrilled with the portrait of a Ptolemaic queen in the center bottom, uh, although I am not quite sure whether this rather youthful limestone head could be attributed to Arsinoe II, as she became queen in Egypt at the age of around 40 years old. I am dismayed to say that this lovely Isis Lactans is not included in TMA's antiquities collection. It was sold recently in a Bonhams auction a couple of years ago with a noble provenance. Uh, apparently that seems to indicate that Mr. Noble had disposed of this statuette before the TMA's acquisition of his collection. It re represents the well-known Egyptian mother goddess Isis suckling her child Hippocrates or Horus, the son of Osiris. Uh, before we move on, perhaps there are questions I can address. Um, please do let me know if there's anything that uh, uh, I could discuss before moving on. Um, if not, um, some of Noble's antiquities have been on display before in venues other than the Tampa Museum of Art. Um, a dedicated show to the noble collection of Attic vases has not been hosted in any national or international show outside of the TMA. So I would now like to present a concept of precisely such an exhibition that will offer a fresh recontextualization and reinterpretation of showpieces of the noble collection based on the most up-to-date scientific, technical, art historical and experimental archaeological research. Allow me to reiterate that in ceramic archaeology, Joseph Noble was a pioneer. The plaques that you see here incidentally are examples of his own research. So you see on the left what it looked like before it went into the oven and on the right, you see the same plaque 
uh, as it appeared once it was fired in the kiln. My proposal rests on three pillars, collection, collaboration, and examination. The prominence of the noble collection of attic vases is beyond question. Engage, engaging partner institutions will elevate the profile of the TMA at a national, even international level, will alleviate the financial burden, so very important in these difficult times, will provide opportunities for discussions about relevant related objects from collections of partner institutions to juxtapose with the selected showpieces of the noble collection. New scientific technical examinations are bound to offer fresh insight about the TMA's collection of noble attic vases. These insights can eventually be presented by means of multimedia visualizations that will certainly fascinate museum goers. And taken together, these three elements of collection, collaboration and examination will lead to an important recontextualization and reinterpretation of the significance of the TMA's antiquity collection. Now, Joanna mentioned in the beginning that I, could you turn back? Uh, sorry, Joanna. Uh, Joanna me mentioned earlier that I worked for a couple of years at the Allard Pearson Museum. Uh, years ago, some similar kind of chart uh, was on display in uh, the Allard Pearson Museum, as you see here. Uh, but this is from the uh, Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto where um, they illustrate how uh, a scene is painted on a vase. What it appears before it goes into the kiln is what you see at the top. And then it, uh, uh, it is fired. Um, certain areas become darker. Then the heat is reduced. Certain areas will turn black. And then it's reoxidized, and other areas will return to their original red state. That is the essential research that uh, Noble has contributed uh, to understanding of how these colors were painted. And the interesting thing that you learn from this, as you can see on the top, no black paint was used to make the black shapes uh, that you see in the end result. Um, but if we move on, Joanna, the opportunity to perform research on the unquestionably prominent collection will doubtless benefit scholars and will certainly interest academic institutions and university museums. Ancient Greek pottery and vase painting have been studied by experts for several centuries in terms of iconography, chronology, shape, style, uh, and more recently, technique. Technical art historical analyses examines mode of production and creation, as well as the raw materials used and artistic tools. Uh, it will offer new means of dating, of, uh, observation, visualization. Such research includes radiocarbon and thermoluminescence dating methods, Röntgen radiography, uh, in other words, X-ray, Gamma ray fluorescence, also known as XRF, as well as infrared, ultraviolet, and reflectance transformation imaging, uh, examples of which you see here on this slide. Examinations inform us about the mineral composition and thus the origin of the clay of the vase, possible underdrawings and primary sketches, the kind of brushes used, numbers and kinds of firings modern repairs and reconstructions, reparations, uh, re, uh, um, and so forth. Um, it's difficult to see in this example, sorry, Joanna, again. <laughs> um, it, it's a little difficult to see, uh, but there's, there are two vases that have near identical illustration of Apollo on them. And when you look to the black and white images that are the RTI, uh, uh, visualizations, you can see the underdrawing, particularly by the nose, um, where the painter has just scratched a line like here is the nose and then uh, later on fills in the details. Uh, and these kinds of sort of shorthands the artist when he is sketching can tell us whether these were painted by the same hand or whether the sketch was made by the same hand. 
which of course is very interesting if you have vases um, that you suspect are by the same artist. So if we move on, I would suggest partnering with three or four institutions where the noble vases could be presented in conjunction with research performed locally. I must stress that we have not been in contact with any institution. This is just the first pitch of a concept. I would think of partners such as the John Hopkins Archaeological Museum in Baltimore, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, and the Athens University Museum or the Netherlands Institute in Athens and their state-of-the-art research facilities. After the vases return to Tampa, the TMA will then be able to present to the visitors what experts have learned from their technical examinations, combined with a sagacious selection of relevant objects from partner collections. The exhibition would include such innovative visualizations as X-ray, infrared, ultraviolet, and RTI visualizations. The project will also provide the opportunity to correct and supplement the research that Noble himself performed about the technical processes by which these vases were created. That is to say, the project will continue in the same spirit and with the same passion as Joseph Noble himself, and we will thus breathe new life in Noble's life's work. But why should a museum visitor wish to come to the Tampa Museum of Art to ex uh, attend an exhibition on the recontextualization of the noble collection of Attic vases? The oft repeated notion that Western civilization is profoundly indebted to the cultural heritage of classical Greece has become contested in public fora for good reasons. The issue plays its part too in the reemergence of Western nationalism as well as the reignition of the civil rights movements, such as Black Lives Matter. Who are the custodians of cultural heritage who decide what is included and what is ex excluded from the Western canon? Indeed, why ancient Greek art should be relevant in our modern multicultural society is not a question with a straightforward answer. The proposed exhibition will allow the TMA to engage the visitors in a dialogue and reconsider these questions for the local community. That all cultural heritage is relevant and belongs to us all is perhaps true, but it's also trite and it doesn't answer the question. A more significant observation is that artists have engaged with ancient Greek art for centuries as a source of inspiration and emulation. Even the modernists who a century ago rejected the ancient uh, heritage cannot avoid the Laconian paradox of being entangled by the very thing they abhor. A deeper appreciation of art, moreover, is gained by reflecting on the past, whether that past be the ancient world, the Mexica cultures, or the Han dynasty. The meaning of life is enhanced by, illumin by the illuminating beauty of art, by a fuller understanding of the past, and by bridging cultural differences, by looking for meaningful similarities as well. These are some of the thoughts that the TMA could address in events and programs scheduled around the exhibition of the recontextualized and reinterpreted noble collection of Attic phases. So before I wrap up my talk, perhaps there are questions I can address. Um, we did get one question in the Q&A that asks, was it controversial, controversial that a Met employee was also collecting? Um, at that time, that was not. Um, and uh, of course, he was not a curator um, whose responsibility was to advise the museum what to collect and what not to collect. Um, in his function, uh, uh, he was not in direct competition, so to say, as a curator would be if a curator would um, work at the museum uh, in a function um, acquiring ancient objects and then would also be uh, acquiring him or herself. But in those days, that was not considered undone uh, or not done as it would be now. 
Um, but let me conclude, and then there will be mo uh, more time uh, afterwards for further questions. The main purpose of this exhibition proposal that I've tried to pitch today is to offer a careful selection of masterpieces of attic vases from the Joseph Fitch Noble Collection for display in a choice of several prominent national and international venues. In addition to displaying the Noble vases, the plan is to partner with research laboratories for performing technical examinations on these selected objects. Suggested partners could include the Johns Hopkins Archaeological Museum in Baltimore, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, and the Athens University Museum or the Netherlands Institute in Athens. Uh, but of course, other partners could be considered as well. Arranging for the exhibition to tour to national and international values will moreover significantly elevate the profile of the permanent antiquities collection of the Tampa Museum of Arts. The ancient world continues to inspire and educate us about art and religion, about cultural exchange and ethnic diversity, and many, many other subjects. The beautiful artifacts on display in the Tampa Museum of Art can thus teach us lessons that remain profoundly relevant today. So please continue to patronize the TMA, to wander around the museum and to wonder about the ancient, modern and contemporary art on display, but please mind social distance for the time being. Feel free to connect in your own personal way with these objects. Thank you for your attention. It has been a great pleasure to propose this exhibition concept to you. I do hope that we may soon meet each other in person. Uh, and if you do have questions, I saw one popping up uh, in the corner of my eye. Uh, I believe there is uh, sufficient time for that left. Um, I would certainly be personally interested in hearing your thoughts about the feasibility of this proposal. Uh, if you would be interested in visiting this exhibition, or uh, if not, why not? Uh, and whether you have any suggestions for improvement. So Joanna, help me. I, Thank don't, you, have to, I don't have the chat function on. I, I thought that was really fantastic. And before we turn to Q&A or um, questions that pop up in our chat, I just wanted to kind of um, start a little bit of a dialogue with you because what I really enjoyed about your talk was giving that background information on Mr. Noble himself and kind of his professional training and where his interests lie. I mean, part of that is, of course, you know, discussed in the galleries, but I'm finding even in my own research for the modern and contemporary collection, we have these um, kind of different time periods where collectors gave us huge you know, collections of work right now, um, as I prepare for the figure forward collection that opens this week, which looks at figuration in our permanent collection. <clears throat> in particular, there was one collector. And if um, Bill Zawatsky is still in the in the group, he'll probably know much more about this. Um, Dr. August Freund, Freundlich, Freundlich, um, sorry, difficult name to pronounce, gifted the museum over 130 works of art. And it goes to show that the museum has had a tradition of really looking to the community, looking to collectors in the community to help us build the collection on both sides with Mr. Noble, with Mr. Zawatsky, with Dr. and Mrs. Perry, and then on the modern contemporary side, um, Mr. Mr. Lohman, um, Dr. Freundlich. It's just, it's really wonderful that um, collectors have thought of the museum as the right home for their collections, as a way to continuously educate and inform the community about um, the significance of cultural objects or the history of art. So I thank you for that. Um, I don't know if you um, found things in Mr. Noble's background and his biography that just really surprised you or shocked you or led new insight into the Tampa Museum of Art. Yeah, no, uh, I, I tried to pick out a few things that, uh, that I found very interesting. Um, uh, Mr. Noble also collected other artifacts that are um, uh, Native American. Um, uh, there are arrowheads that he collected as a child that sort of triggered <clears throat> his interest in the past. Um, but um, I imagine 
because of his interest in antiquity and his work at the Metropolitan Museum, um, when you have the financial means to start acquiring a collection, you can do that in a haphazard way. Uh, sometimes when you ask uh, a collector, like, why did you purchase this particular object? They would say, oh, I just like the nose or I'd like the face. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's something very personal that um, uh, could be also considered haphazard. Um, Mr. Noble sat down and thought, what is it that I want to achieve with my collection? And uh, that is something that uh, makes this collection so outstanding that he knew what it was that he was searching for, so that when you see something uh, that is available for sale in an auction or some other uh, avenue, that you don't just buy it because you think it's nice, but you purchase it because it is something that fits in your collection, that it fills a lacuna in, in what you have. So um, mm -hmm. when I mentioned that the pseudo panathenaic vase uh, is Mr. Noble's prize collection, um, you can imagine that the Panathenaic Games were the uh, uh, festival in which all of Athens came together to celebra celebrate their identity. So to win the first prize and get this enormous vase filled with oil, uh, that was something that uh, Athenians must have been very proud of to win. And so Mr. Noble wanted to have a vase like that. And he could not have a true one in the full scale, um, but even at half size, the Panathenaic vase that he acquired uh, is really very beautiful. And that is something that, you know, he had on his wish list. Uh, and so when one uh, um, became available, he knew that is the one I want. I've been looking for that for 10 years and now is the time to bid for it. If you don't have a kind of scope of the field that you want, you might buy uh, uh, things that later on you uh, regret, um, or you might later on regret not purchasing something because you, did, you didn't have it in your field of vision of what it is that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is something that uh, I particularly admire, which makes um, this collection so, uh, so terrific. And it's not just great for Tampa, it, it's the best collection in, in Florida and probably um, in uh, the Southeast. Was there, in, in preparing for this talk, was there any one object in the Noble collection that really kind of struck your fancy that you there are, could there are hours and hours of research to? There are, there are many. I like to, uh, to, to look at those scarabs that were, that are in amber. Mm -hmm. uh, they are apparently the first thing Bill Zawatsky informed me about. They are apparently the first ancient objects that he purchased. But are they ancient? Can we, uh, can we learn more about where they came from? Um, insects caught in amber are obviously uh, uh, something rare and something valuable. Uh, they are turned into um, earrings. Uh, and I've never seen something like this. Uh, and it's it's fascinating. And I can certainly imagine that a 14-year-old boy would be uh, enthralled to have those kinds of objects and that that triggers further interest. Uh, so yeah, there there's a lot, uh, Joanna. But of course, the, the Ptolemaic Queen is my all-time favorite. It's yeah. an absolutely beautiful sculpture. Uh, and um, uh, I, I cannot emphasize how much it matters if you see it in, in real life. I obviously saw it on photos, but when in uh, November last year, I came to the museum and saw it in person, it is a completely different story. Uh, and that, that makes all the difference. And obviously it's hard right now to come to, uh, to museums with social distancing and everything, uh, but it, it does make a, a big difference. Um, in the preview, uh, Brittany inserted uh, a scene from a Napoleon vase, uh, which she knows that I like very much. And there is no way of explaining how big that vase is until you actually stand in front of it. It's incredible to, uh, to experience that, to, to, to see the scale of it. Uh, and those are things that are just absolutely amazing in this collection. And um, for the audience, um, 
we are practicing um, very careful social distancing at the museum. So if you haven't been to the museum in a while, come on down. We are a safe and beautiful space. In fact, right now is almost the best time to come visit because the galleries are very nice and quiet. You can just have a really intimate and kind of meditative um, visit at the Tampa Museum of Art. So I encourage all of you to, to do, please come. We are a safe space. Before I turn it over to questions, I just want to make one final point um, and that as much fun it is to organize our own exhibitions, to host traveling exhibitions from you know, across the world, across the country, the most important work that we can do as curators is to dig into our permanent collections and to continue that research. You and I are the stewards of these collections and it's critical that we keep building on the research for not just our own kind of self-interest, but for the future of the museum and for future audiences. Um, it's just, I think, again, just the most important thing that we can do as curators is to really look at that collection deeply and just to continue to care for it the best that we can. And it's great to see kind of this new information, new research that you've done, Bronco, on the, um, the Noble Collection. And I hope to continue to do the same on my side on the Modern Contemporary Collection. Absolutely. It's an, in, an, an incredible resource, uh, not just for artistic purposes, but for so many others. <clears throat> Why does someone collect? Uh, what can we learn about the material? Um, th there are so many aspects uh, of which the collection provides this resource mm -hmm. that you can do uh, research on. Um, and with anything, the more you look into it, the more interesting it gets. Absolutely, and there's so much more to share and educate our community about with this collection. So I'm going to look at some of these questions. Um, that we have. Um, we have one from our executive director, Dr. Michael Tomor. How complicated has it become for international exchange at this time? Yeah, it's, it's uh, on one hand, it's a challenge um, because you cannot go to museums uh, uh, in the Netherlands. We are back in, clo uh, in lockdown. Uh, it's hard to go to uh, libraries. Um, they are, they've been shut down uh, uh, because of the lockdown uh, many months this year. Um, but as a result, people find each other on the internet in email lists or chat groups or uh, on Facebook. Uh, and it's a simple question like, I'm looking for this or that page from a book or people just uh, uh, ask for PDF versions um, for, uh, an article and people like within hours, sometimes even less, you get a response. Uh, and that is something where um, you find a community and it's not a big community of ancient historians or of Egyptologists <clears throat> or uh, whatever your specialization is, but people know where to find each other and they support each other. And uh, the further you're away from, uh, from a university or a library, uh, the sooner you probably get help. Uh, and that is something that is uh, very encouraging. And uh, even though I am uh, so far away from you, um, the TMA has been willing to, to share information. Someone like Bill Zawatsky has provided me with uh, an enorm enormous amount of information. So all the research I do at, at this time now is at home. Mm -hmm. uh, but even though I'm alone at home, uh, there's also a whole community around me. And I know that many colleagues uh, feel the same, that um, uh, we are there for each other, if we, even if we cannot be personally together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We have several comments in our Q&A that um, are more comments rather than questions, but um, really loving this idea that you've proposed, Bronco. Um, we have one viewer who says, I love this idea. I'd like to know more about the interaction from each vase and the iconography painted on it. Um, Mr. Zawatsky, who we keep mentioning, um, says, thank you, Bronco, for your superb survey of the Noble Collection. And he hopes that um, with the Olympic events happening every four years, that perhaps we can show more of those vases in the Noble Collection that feature athletic or ancient events. And um, our new friend to the museum, Mr. Nico Stratakis, who is the um, focus of your first lecture, sends his congratulations to you and to TMA. And it says he thinks it would be great for Greece and Europe um, in general to have a chance to see these bases and to learn about them. So to bring them on a broader international stage. And that's, 
He hasn't seen those vases before in the Greek museum. So it would bring something pretty remarkable to Greece. So congratulations and well done. Thank you from, uh, from the Greek party, terrific. Um, let me just see if there are any more popping through. Brittany, did you have any that come through on Facebook? We had one question regarding reservations and requirements to visit the museum. Um, reservations are recommended, but not required. And you can learn more about the steps we are taking by visiting tampamuseum.org forward slash visit. Fantastic. Well, I think we are getting close to the end of our talk. I do want to give another plug for your lecture, Bronco, on November, November 18th, I believe it is. I'm sorry, November 15th, Sunday, November 15th at 1 p.m. on Minoan Gnosis. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Bronco? Pronounced K also. Uh, in, in Greek, it's Knossos. Minoan Knossos and the Labyrinth of the Minotaur. And the nice thing, of course, is that Knossos, the ancient city, is very close to Heracleion, which is the sister city of Tampa. Excellent. Fantastic. Well, we hope you all join us for the third lecture in this series. And just thank you again, Bronco, for joining us. And okay. to everybody, thank you for spending your Sunday afternoon with us. We we'll hope to see you again very soon. Thanks for joining us and hope to uh, meet each other soon. Fantastic. All right, everybody, take care, stay safe, and hope to see you soon at the museum. Bye-bye.